And I think the more taboo and secretive things are, the bigger the fear around it, regardless of whether that fear is justified. So I absolutely think talking openly about it and reflecting on our own reactions to knowing that we're mortal, be it through our life experience, through our parents and patients, I think that's all crucial. That was Dr. Sunita Piri, palliative care physician and author of best-selling book, That Good Night, Life and Medicine in the 11th Hour. She's our guest this episode, and she's been featured in the New York Times, the LA Times, and joins us to talk about the power of language in the face of dying, how culture intersects with medicine, and the art of communication as a clinician and writer. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Sunita, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And so are we. I wanted to ask a question um, about how you've given lots of talks. You talked about how your first love was really language and being a writer. And so what was your path to becoming a palliative care doctor? Yeah. So, um, you know, when I was a kid, my dad used to make me write a page a week on or page a day rather on any subject of my choosing, but he just really wanted me to learn to speak and to write English well. And so I had free reign on those pages to write about anything I wanted. And because I was kind of a typical child of immigrants who both worked very hard and were home late, I would eventually find refuge in the page and the characters I would make up, which were wacky, but I felt a lot of companionship in my own head and with my own words, because if I was writing and inventing people around me, then I wasn't alone in my house after school. And so I carried that love of storytelling throughout my life. And I really, when I went into medicine, one of my one of the things that drew me the most was this idea of the stories that people bring, the stories they bring of their life experience, but also the stories that their bodies tell us about what they've been through and about where they are and the possibilities of where they may go. And so when I was doing my rotations and learning medicine and learning how to interact with people, the moments that were most compelling to me were the ones where in order to make any clinical decisions in order to really try to help come up with the best plan forward for somebody, I had to really set aside biology for a moment and really delve into how people understand their lives and their bodies. Because it was really only from that place of precise understanding that I could really help them to think about where we go from that point of illness. And so You know, that to me, thinking about things like, you know, in palliative care, people will often say to me, I'm a fighter. And, you know, I I will look at them and say, help me understand what that means to you. Help me understand what you're fighting for. If you're waiting for a miracle, tell me what a miracle looks like to you. And can we hold hope in one palm for both the miracle that we hope for and the possibility that something else may come to pass. Mm-hmm. And I think so much of what I, how I approach family meetings, for example, has to do with the narrative structure that you learn as a writer mm-hmm. and has so much to do with how you think about what the character in front of you is saying, how they're saying it, how you mirror their language and meet them where they are. And so I always had that in me, and I feel very fortunate that in palliative care, there's a place for me as a humanist and as a physician. Mm -hmm. You know, I love it. Uh, Who wouldn't want that kind of care? Really, from every single care provider that they touch points with along the way. And I just think to myself, as I'm celebrating what you're saying, how unfortunate it is that people would find someone like you or like me uh, at the tail end of sometimes a very long journey. 
where people sit and take the time to understand who they are and their story. I very much think that the fact that we arrive later than we could really have been of benefit to the human being in front of us and maybe even potentially changed the decisions they would make and the fulfillment they would have experienced from their lives, that to me is one of the tragedies of modern medicine. And I actually have come to see palliative medicine as a corrective to the blind spots of medicine. So basic things like, how do we manage pain? How do we think about pain management as related to function and not just a pain scale? How do we think about, you know, what someone's life means to them in the context of their disease? And how do we think about words like dignity and suffering? What do those actually mean? And these are the things we explore in our field and they, our field exists because medicine doesn't do a good job with this. And the title of my book um, that good night, life and medicine in the 11th hour. I chose that phrase very specifically because that's kind of my analogy to the crew, to the cleanup crew that we're showing it up often, far too often at 1159 when we should have been there at like 12 noon. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the problem just in the culture of medicine, but also in a lot of societal cultures is that we are so hell bent on a goal of preserving life at all costs, no matter what that life looks like, that we lose sight of the humanity of our profession and the humanity of the people that we're trying to treat. Mm -hmm. So I think there's the societal expectations that we can live forever and that aging just doesn't happen. And as someone who lived in California and Los Angeles, mm -hmm. most of her life, I can say I've seen firsthand mm -hmm. the way the defiance of aging or the defiance of a body that changes mm -hmm. really influences how people engage with medicine, but also how medicine engages with patients. Mm -hmm. And so if we have that going, and then we have our own socialization mm -hmm. as physicians, to think it's my fault, mm -hmm. the chemo doesn't work. The chemo mm -hmm. worked for this patient, a different patient in the same situation. So it's got to work for this person. And if it doesn't, at some level, I'm going to believe that's my fault, whether or not that's conscious or subconscious. Mm -hmm. So you have the marriage of these two really tough cultural trends um, that kind of come together and it's a very problematic marriage. And then you get palliative involved and we should have been the family therapist a long time before we actually got called in. Um, and so navigating those troubled waters is something that I think the ultimate price is paid by patients and their families. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Sunita, you, you sort of mentioned your book. It's an award-winning book. It's beautifully written. It tells personal stories, patient stories. For listeners who haven't yet, you know, um, seen it, what would they expect? Like, why did you write this? And what were you trying to get across through this, through this storytelling? Yeah. So um, my book is an interwoven set of stories. One big strand of the narrative is me being the daughter of Indian immigrants who were very deeply spiritual and specifically the daughter of my mom, who is an anesthesiologist. So the personal strands of the narrative are about how, what it meant to grow up biculturally, what it meant to grow up learning from a young age that in our spiritual tradition, all things are temporary, whether it's a cloud in the sky or the pain and sorrow or the joy that you feel or our changing bodies and our relationships to one another, that change is the constant in life. And so the goal of a spiritual tradition is helping you to navigate that turbulence by remembering who you essentially are, which is not your body, which is not anything of this physical realm. And I grew up, you know, with a mom who was very much a scientist, but who would pray with her patients if they wanted that before going to the operating room, who would call on our God in the operating room internally to help guide her through tough moments with very complicated patients. So I grew up with this model where science and spirituality were not diametrically opposed. They were actually complementary. And then I went to medical school where we, I think 
when I remember my own training, there was one session that we had on death and dying in my first year. And it was a small group session where essentially we talked about losses that we've had. And I think what we imagined when we imagine our own death. And that was pretty much it. And then you go on to the wards. And when I went on to the wards, the kind of second set of stories stories that I've interwoven is really about what it meant to be socialized in a way that privileged extension of life without regard to suffering. And you confront this as a student, and you see that this patient who's really sick with COPD and HIV and has a pneumonia that's never going to get better, you see that person go to the ICU on a ventilator because that's what you do. Right? Because when someone can't breathe, we intubate them and put them on a ventilator. But the questions that really started to come up for me through these stories were what about the gulf between what we can do and what we should do for the person in front of us? And so much of the storytelling in the book is coming from that place of ethical and narrative tension of what is it that me, the human being taking care of this patient feels versus what is me as the scientist and the doctor feeling at this point? And what I wanted to do when I wrote the book was to offer to people what I wish I had had in my own training or in my own life as a writer, because I just didn't see a whole lot of books by women of color who were immigrants, who were writing about the clash of cultures on many, many different levels and how the price again is paid by the patient and the patient's body. And so to me, the personal and the professional were always intertwined. Um, it's just a beautiful, like you said, interwoven um, layers there actually. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself after reading it, what, what would you hope that someone would close the book and take a deep breath and what? So my hope in writing it was that people would close the book and take a breath at many different places. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when you're re when you, when I was writing it, I had to constantly stop and take a breath and refresh and reframe. And I revised it many, many, many times. I think most people outside of writing don't know that all writing is rewriting. And so you get a first draft of your book or a first draft of a story or first draft of a chapter done, and then you set it aside and you go back. And every time I went back, I would pause and ask myself, what am I trying to do here? Because some writing especially in first drafts, can be very unstructured. And honestly, from a craft perspective, it should be unstructured. It should just be getting a story out, getting it down on paper. And when I went back, I really thought about what was I trying to get the reader to think about without hitting them over the head with it mm -hmm. in every passage. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that when people are reading at different points that they can set it down and say, what did this bring up for me emotionally and why? If I have to close the book right now, what is it that's making me close the book? Mm -hmm. If I can't stop with this story and I want more and more, what am I hungering for? And sometimes that's practical advice. Sometimes, which I don't really have practical advice in the book because it's literary nonfiction, but there are things in there like my own failings with having a family meeting. Maybe somebody reading the book said those same stupid things that I said when I was an intern, even though their intention was good. So sometimes it's just how do you craft a family meeting in a way that works? How do you deal with the fallout when it doesn't? If you're a patient or family member or just a human in the world reading this book, what is it that impacts you on a cellular level and why? And so I think those are kind of all of the things I hope people take away in the pauses. And also just because I deeply love language, I hope that some of the sentences also just make readers stop and take a breath because they're beautiful. And I'm not, I'm not singing my praises. It's just the hope of every writer is that part of taking someone's breath away is the narrative, but also how you are crafting the narrative.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, so much of the waiting room revolution is about deconstructing this idea of palliative care, the language and the stigma around it, and trying to maybe think about it upstream and in plain language or maybe different language so that it's more accessible to, to people. So I'm curious to know if you see overlap between what we're trying to do here with the waiting room revolution and your own writing and work. Oh, definitely. Because I think when you think about how we try to evolve in medicine and helping people make better decisions or make more informed decisions, so much of it comes down not only to communication in terms of the language we use, but how we're framing things. And I think that's where the waiting room revolution is really spectacular because you're getting not only at the specific language, you're going into the language because the concepts need reframing. So palliative care, not as a cleanup crew, but as something that is part of, and I'll tell my patients is part of doing everything for you. So people who say, I want everything done. And that's a conceptual reframe, right? It's not just about the word everything. And so I think that what you're trying to do with this project is really essential in that way that it's not just about the words, it's about why have the words become useless and how can we change that as a way to empower people? And I think empowerment is really what good patient care is all about. You know, it's so interesting because I'm listening to so much of what you're saying and how you're presenting it. And it really reminds me of cultural anthropology. And I know that you have a background in that. And I'm just curious, you know, with an anthropologist hat on and your years in medicine, but also, you know, since the book, have you seen a change in the patients and how, how receptive they are to a reframe or a more death positive movement? Have you seen some changes in in your clinical practice? So that's an excellent question. And I think I would answer it in two ways. One, I have definitely seen the burgeoning of more death positive activities. So things like death over dinner or death cafes and, you know, death doulas. There's like a card deck someone sent me, which is like, kind of a game you can play with people where you pick out a card and it asks a question about death and everybody answers it. So there's a lot more awareness and resources, kind of almost like sex education evolved. I think those two topics are so similarly taboo that one followed the trend of the other. I would like to tell you that I think a lot of things have changed in my clinical practice. And I was certainly hoping that COVID would change some things. And I think, unfortunately, I can't say that there's been a huge turnaround. And here's why. I think that in order to get people to be more open or to have them soften to the idea that mortality is a thing, Mm -hmm. (laughs) this is not something we can cure. It's such an essential basic fear of mankind that one day I will not exist. And so in order to really see a widespread revolution, I think so much of that has to begin individually. Mm -hmm. And the outside trends can influence, you know, like I think undoubtedly there were people who saw loved ones die on ventilators during COVID and thought I would never want to go that way. And we're open about that. Um, But I also think that there's an equal number of people who still hesitate to talk and think about these things no matter what they've seen because suppressing that stuff is also very human Mm -hmm. and so I think within medicine I feel like there has been more appreciation for the value of goals of care conversations for the importance of palliative care I saw a lot of residents become really good at quick goals discussions because they had to become better at them and I've seen them sustain that even, you know, as the pandemic has softened a bit. But I think on an individual level, I it's really mixed results. And I think some of that is community specific. So death cafes and death over dinner reach or speak to a specific demographic that's not always the patients that I see. So people of different linguistic or cultural backgrounds for whom talking about death 
might be something that they want to do, but it's not something that it's still something that remains alien or taboo for specific reasons in their culture. I think that's the sort of stuff that needs to change within specific communities. And some of this other stuff happening is really kind of accessing mostly pretty well-educated, well-off people. So I think within palliative, there's there's so much work that needs to be done in thinking about how do we craft a message that's not just speaking to a specific, almost like preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think when I hear that people have been diagnosed in my non-professional or in my personal life with a progressive life limiting illness, it's sad, but it doesn't shock me the way it shocks other people. But it's still sad and I wish it didn't happen to someone. So so there's that acceptance of the fact that we're all going to get something at some point, right? Um, and I think I, I go through the process of hearing updates about people in my private life. It doesn't um, stop me in my tracks the same that it would other people because it's just so normal for me. But I think the biggest impact it has on the fact that it's so normal in my home and I see my daughters um, also responding differently than their cousins whose homes maybe they don't talk a lot about it but um, so I feel like there's this natural ripple effect on my family um, mm -hmm. and, and they're just uh, normal life cycle stuff but other than that, I'm trying, I'm, I'm stretched to think like, how can we sell mortality awareness? <laughs> like what are, what that's are a question? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're right that there's two things that came to mind. One, this idea that what we do, we're so used to it. And I'm often reminded of what a gift it is, but also how interesting it is that it's become normal to us when a med student rotates, because they're going to see the stuff not as often on their normal rotations, not normal, not as if palliative is an abnormal <laughs> rotation, but there's an abnormal amount of exposure to death and suffering. And um, when I'm reminded that this is so shocking for them, it's kind of speaking to what you're saying that for a random person out there, what we do every day is unfathomable, but it's equally unfathomable that it doesn't stop us in our tracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm like, have I just become numb to this? Or am I taking a lesson away from this? Like you're saying, like, why am I not bungee jumping every day? You know, yeah. fear of death be damned. But it is interesting because I think it goes back to that same, like we know it intellectually, but how do we act on the knowledge of our mortality and finitude? Mm -hmm. And I very much think a lot of that is talking about it openly, like you do to normalize it in your family, right? The way that I have a friend whose family talked very openly to her about sex and dating when we were in high school. And I, that was just absolutely off topic, <laughs> not allowed in my family. And I admired it so much because she wasn't afraid of things to the extent I was, or just was very, it was healthy because it was out in the open. And I think the more taboo and secretive things are, the bigger the fear around it, regardless of whether that fear is justified. So I absolutely think talking openly about it and reflecting on our own reactions to knowing that we're mortal, be it through our life experience, through our parents and patients, I think that's all crucial. Maybe we won't know the full extent of the benefits of being in the know like we are until our time comes and maybe it will be then where we see the, you know, more benefits to the life that we've lived. So walking so closely with dying and death all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right. It is really impossible to know until you're at the edge and what that will feel like and whether the preparation has helped you to be clear-eyed in some ways, but still, you know, looking at things through the bleary lens of grief in other ways. 
So I have a question for you that I'm just so curious about. So you write a lot about culture and spirituality and how they intersect with dying. And you write a lot about medicine and your own Indian upbringing as recurring themes in your, in your work. So I'm Chinese, and in my own life, I often encounter situations where members of my extended family are, honestly, they're very resistant to this idea of palliative care. Um, for example, the idea of having a will in some cases uh, is, implies that you know, you're know you speeding up death and talking about it is very taboo. You know, Obviously, in my work, I talk a lot about the benefits of an early palliative care approach all the time. So I'm curious from your own experiences, how do you bridge between this notion of palliative care and different cultural and spiritual beliefs? Such an important question. And I think that the questions we're asking about the role of culture broadly defined and the role of spirituality broadly defined are important categories to be thinking about. And the way I kind of have always approached it is to get the person in front of me to tell me the ground rules of their life and whether or not that they relate that to their background, spiritual, religious, or cultural. Because I think sometimes, you know, we are very well intentioned in talking about how different groups broadly defined think about things, especially with regards to end of life and dying. And yet, I will say that for every Indian family like mine that has more of an embrace of the natural progression of life and death, I have seen families who are from the same region as me who have a very different orientation towards how they think about dying, whether they think about life's temporality, um, and the choices they make, even with the same information given to them. So I think one thing I have learned, both as somebody who's a you know a person of color and bicultural, and also somebody who's on the doctoring side of that, is that we kind of have to have those buckets of culture, language, spirituality, religion as components for how we think about people. But ultimately, we need to let people tell us the culture in their own family, in their own life, and whether or not the buckets that we're looking at play out in the ways that we think they do. And so there's that kind of idea of cultural humility, of knowing what you know, and then being humble about what you don't know. And I think we know so little about those realms in general. And so I 1000% can relate to having a book come out where I know some of my family is just like, I'm only going to read this for the gossip about your mom and I'm not <laughs> going to read anything else. And then there's going to be others who are like, thank you for doing this. Like it's about time. So, and then those are people within the same family even. So it's such a complex and important and nuanced question you're asking. And I think sometimes it's as simple as saying to the person, it sounds like this is a belief that structures your approach to these conversations. Can you tell me more about that? Mm -hmm. And if they say, yes, this is the culture of, you know, people in this region of Korea, or no, this is just an atypical thing that in our family, our nuclear family, we do things this way, but my aunt's family is completely different then you actually get them to define the terms mm -hmm. and say whether this is truly cultural or just their orientation on the world. And I think of a lot of things, this is so silly, but you know, in medicine, we're always asking the question of how does this change management? So if I draw a set of labs on you and I'm just drawing them because every day I can just click the CBC order set or the, you know, the chem seven and I'll just get your labs every day. I remember a resident asking me, why are you ordering the CBC? What are you going to do if the number's not what you expect? Mm -hmm. And so I think the same thing about asking questions about culture and spirituality and religion is, what is it, how is our management going to change by asking things explicitly versus allowing things to arise as they do in an interview with a patient? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking as you're... Give, uh, offering us your beautiful um, answer is 
you know, wouldn't it be great if people, if citizens, if new patients and families could naturally come to the healthcare relationship and offer some of this up, that they knew that it it could help the healthcare system understand them better and not have to wait to be asked again um, at the 11th hour about you know, what helps guide um, decision-making, et cetera, et cetera. There is something about empowering at, at patients and families and self-management and just inviting them to come forward um, and declare who they are. Uh, you know, when you go in and you buy a pair of jeans, you usually say, okay, um, all right, I need a pair of jeans and um, I'm not really interested in this and I don't really like that. And I'm looking for a pair of, you know what I mean? Like you sort of, you don't just show I wasted, up. Boot yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't just show up at the door and say nothing. You just, yeah. <laughs> but they just stand in front of like the Levi's just and like pointing. Assume they're going to pull you in and start showing you the jeans and know what kind, you know, is right for you. It's, it would be nice to think in the future that people uh, have some kind of um, personal information that they offer up right away from the beginning of an illness journey. I think that's a great idea. And it kind of is a reminder to them that everything you have to tell me about your personhood is going to figure very prominently in how we go forward together. And it's just such a nice signal from the beginning that this is about you and not a person in a textbook or a clinical trial with your same disease. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be, that is just a wonderful idea. And I don't actually know how often that's done in a meaningful way. Because you know why the healthcare system doesn't know what to do with it. It's to your point, like you have to know what are you going to do when you get the answers, right? The healthcare system struggles with being flexible. And so for people to come and say, this is the way I, I'm hoping it goes, or this is what I would like of my journey, or it, it's, yeah, that we don't know what to do with that because standard care and guidelines and uh, best practice and all of these things are for populations of people and it's hard for us to tailor things, but it is possible. It's just, we don't, we're not trained to know how to do that, to, to flex left and right and shift. I think that's so true. And we really kind of lag behind our intentions to want to bring attention to the right things. But then it's kind of like when we have family meetings and I'll watch the residents or even some of my attending colleagues ask a question that they know they need to ask, but not know how to navigate the answer. And that to me, just generally speaking, is what I find missing from pal good rigorous teaching about palliative care communication is I don't care if you know you can memorize this guide or that guide. I want to know what are you going to do with a difficult answer? Then what? Yeah. And so it's kind of it's in the same vein as what you're saying that, yes, we need to have awareness of what we need to do or ask. Mm -hmm. But then how does that translate into making someone's illness experience better? Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think at minimum. A person will feel seen. Yeah, that's minimum, right? So I might not know what to do with this, but I heard you. Yeah. You know, until the lag isn't there. I like that you said that. I think we're lagging behind our intentions. Mm -hmm. And it's like the idea of bearing witness. Yeah. That's just so much of what we do and allowing space for that and ourselves being okay with it. I think that's a hard skill to learn. I had a piece a few years ago, no, last year, last year about around this time, actually in the New York times, really about how do we bear witness to the things we can't change? And a lot of that was what happened with the massive amount of grief and public discussion of it with COVID. It's like, we want to bring someone a casserole. We want to do something. And instead of it, this idea of don't just stand there, do something, it's don't just do something, stand there. Mm -hmm. It's like an inversion in a very Zen way that we are, as a society, I think, really uncomfortable with. 
I would love to know what, do you have any exciting projects coming up, whether it's writing projects or research projects, or what are some of the things that you're excited about that are coming up? So I recently took a new job as the program director for the Palliative Care Fellowship at the University of Massachusetts. And I'm really excited to be in this role because I was previously a program director running a palliative care program. We didn't have a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And I really missed kind of just the idea of working with someone who's going to join my profession, like my actual specialty, not like me working with the Palm Fellows or the Ankh Fellows, who I also loved in my last job. But there's something different about mentoring someone who wants to do exactly what you do. Um, and it's a very different skill set. It's a really fun adventure. And I have a truly fantastic fellow. I mean, he's amazing. I'm very much lucked out with having this person be my first fellow. Um, so that's something that I think a lot about is how do we teach these things? How do I bring like my narrative and language focus um, in teaching somebody who may relate to language in a very different way? And so exploring that has been a really exciting part of my new responsibilities over the last six months. And I am writing some essays. I have a piece coming out in the New Yorker this spring, um, which I will absolutely tell you about when it's closer to the pub date. And I have a couple pieces coming out in the Times as well about varied topics. Um, and I'm working on my second book, which is also memoir and also has a lot of medicine and patients in it. But it's, I think, a lot more. So it's about the embodied experience of trauma, broadly speaking. And so I think it's a very different book. Um, but I'm really, it's just, it's making me think about a lot of things in a whole different way. And that's the excitement of, as you know, taking on a book project is you start with one idea and you just don't know what the final product is going to be or what it's, what kind of crossroads you'll come to along the way. It's so true that um, when you just think about something, or even if you just speak to something, it is very different when you put pen to paper or however you write that the slowing down of your mind, uh, you know, um, pieces things together differently than if you had just spoken about it or just took a walk and thought about it. Oh, those are very important um, types of expression as well. But there is something about writing that I think is um, uh, very nourishing for the person who's writing as well. Um, I'm wondering if I could ask you about your program director uh, role, your new role, uh, yeah. what you think future palliative care doctors need to learn. Uh, do you think future palliative care doctors need to be a different breed or have different skills than we have historically needed? What a great question. I think there's two parts to that. One is how do we build upon the tools we have now so that that issue of here are the conversation guides, how can I teach you with different tools how to navigate people's responses or how to navigate your colleague statements in family meetings? Like I think there's a lot of kind of teaching in the interstitium that has yet to be developed. Um, in a more systematic way. I think even kind of teaching people who are up and coming how to be leaders in a system that is often looking at what can palliative care do to save us money. And I think also, how do you learn how to speak to community-based people and academic people and hospital leadership? That was definitely not a part of my curriculum. And it's something I think a lot about with my fellows. So I'm gonna have him do a community-based project um, around, you know, in the city of Worcester. And I think that's going to be an important part of growth for him or for, you know, whoever we get to work with in the future, because the changes that we want to see happen are not just in guidelines or in the hospital, it's out in the lived community. So I think that's something that fellows and trainees of all backgrounds need to start to learn is that skill set of how do you engage in community level change. 
And I also think to that end, how do you teach your colleagues and meet them where they are? Because I think we have a lot of discussions about that. That was a skill set I had to learn by trial and error. And I think finding more formal ways to teach that and to give people feedback is so important. Like I'm doing a faculty development thing for our group on Wednesday. And I just really want to talk about how do we each approach debriefing after a family meeting? I mean, it's such a small little thing that happens all the time. And it's hard to even find a good tool within palliative care to provide some structure around how do you debrief this, not just with yourself and your trainee, but everyone involved. And so that just today was something that I was thinking a lot about is there's a lot of stylistic variation in terms of how we relate to people and have meetings, but there's also some things that could be much better structured. And I think that's going to be a fun challenge for those of us who are mid-career and those of us who are coming up. Mm-hmm. It's true. I, I, I'm, as I'm trying to think, have I ever seen any structured debriefing tool? I, I haven't really. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm not there when my colleagues debrief. Mm-hmm. If they but, do. you know, it, it's true though, because backing up to what you said about how future palliative care doctors should have more formal skills in what it means to be a mentor and a coach and to work clinically, but allow the people around you to learn from what you're doing, like you're teaching and doing your clinical work at the same time. It's, it's an art, right? Um, part, part of one of the tools we have is being invited to family meetings. There's lots of structure around that, but the debriefing can be a very powerful, um, capacity building tool for the people who were at the meeting, right? Yes. Of reflection, mindfulness, and, uh, what did you think about the body language and, you know, totally. And that's distinct from feedback. Yeah, which is the other thing that I'm trying to do in this talk to them is make sure that like we've done, I've invited people to give talks about how do you give feedback, but then how do you give feedback to a mid-year fellow and how do you debrief after a meeting of of different types of meetings? I think that there's just so much that we still have yet to do that's fascinating. Um, So I think there's a lot, I'm a big nerd about this stuff, so best part of um, doing these podcasts is um, meeting new people, honestly, and and getting excited with each other uh, about the words that we use or the angle that we take or, you know, it's, um, yeah, it it is just, um, it's motivating. And I I really love that because, you know, sometimes you can feel tired in your work. And then when you hear someone else get excited about something, And especially if you're, you know, kindred spirits and speaking from the same song page, whatever it it is um, energizing. So I really appreciate that. I mean, so much of, you know, your storytelling is so beautiful. You have this angle of cultural anthropology. You're you're observing how we think about death and dying. But in my heart, I feel like after this conversation, you're also trying to create change, like cultural change and make things better. So I'm curious from what you've seen on your book tour, talking to many people across uh, the country, around the world, what are some of the best ideas that give you hope that, you know, are, are exciting and emerging that, you know, will really make a difference? That is a great question. And, you know, I have to think about that for a minute in terms of ideas. I mean, one thing I have definitely seen in many places, including places that, you know, as a biased West Coast person, you wouldn't necessarily expect. But, you know, I was in um, Oklahoma for a talk, and there were these two women who were just volunteering to spread awareness of death in their little rural community. And I just thought, wow, you know, what a challenge to take on in a small town where, you know, I don't know what the dynamics are, but it just strikes me as a very brave thing to do. Um, So that was one thing that I just remember thinking, you know, we do these things in hospitals and we do these things at sometimes more formal events, but for someone to really just want to go door to door and talk about the importance of advanced directives, 
you know, I think that's hugely inspiring and important. Um, I've also just like a friend of mine, friends of mine who are artists have kind of wanted to learn more, move closer into the inner sanctum of people who are suffering and dying to make more artistic representations of those processes in a very intentional way. And that's also something that I've seen from outside of medicine that gives me hope that there are other ways to reach people and that artists are thinking really deeply about how to do that. So it's not just, you know, me in a bookstore or someone, you know, giving a lecture in Grand Rounds. It's really like people having more of a desire to address this taboo and affect change in meaningful ways, whether it's going door to door or, you know, doing an exhibit, making patient beds and like asking people to think about what it's like to be in that bed when you're in the ICU. So there's just a lot of things like that that have given me pause and made me think, wow, people are so creative and problem solving or just like naming an issue and thinking about going about it in a way that would never have occurred to me. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. Sunita, thank you so much. I'd love to leave it with the last question of how can people learn more about your work, purchase your book and follow you? The book is available at your local independence. It's available on Amazon. You can really find it anywhere. Um, and my website is www.sunitapuri.com. And you'll find a lot of my other interviews and articles accessible there. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the handle at sunitapuriMD. And it's been so wonderful to be in conversation with you both. I'm super excited about your book and all the ideas that have led up to it. And I have no doubt it's going to make a huge change for a lot of people. And I know what it is to write a book. It's a huge, it's like birthing something. The gestation's not fun and neither is the labor, but then you hold this beautiful thing in your hands and it's all worth it. Well, thank you. We're, we're excited about the launch and excited to meet other amazing authors like yourself and learn from you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com, to learn more about our movement and how you can join in. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shilpa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketsa. <laughs>